scripture reading this morning will be from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. beautiful day and a beautiful opportunity to come out to worship our God. We have a number that are visiting with us. We are so thankful that you are here. A couple of weeks ago, I did a sermon on Jonah. And what I found interesting at the end of Jonah is why Jonah runs. And it got me thinking about how people struggle with this today. So as you lay the foundation of this sermon, I just want you to consider what Jonah, the fourth chapter in verse two has to say. You know the story. Assyria was a horrible, horrible nation. They were ruthless to people. <clears throat> the stories that you can read about in history of how they treated people, not that others did much better, but they were horrible. And Jonah saw this and heard the stories. And God is sending him to Nineveh. And so Jonah's mind, I can't go. I have to go the opposite direction, and that's what he tries to do. You all know the story about the fish. He gets spat out. And then you come to chapter 4. Jonah has gone into Nineveh, and he's taught. And what happens in Nineveh is exactly what Jonah was afraid was going to happen in Nineveh. And that is that they repented. And this is what it says in verse 2. Then he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish, since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster. What a fascinating way or view that Jonah has of God. The God that we read of of the Old Testament. And I was thinking about this because when people read the Old Testament, a lot of times they come away thinking, or perhaps not actually reading it, they just hear things, that God is just severe. That's all He is. He's killing people all the time. Destroying people. But the people that lived at that time had a very different view of God. So much so that Jonah wanted God to be severe to Assyria. I want you to destroy them. But I knew if I went there that there was a chance that they would repent. And if they did, you are so compassionate and so kind I knew that you would forgive them. So I ran. So the question comes up. Is our perspective or people's perspective today of looking back at God in the Old Testament a little skewed? Or were the people that lived then a little off? I can answer the question very quickly for you. Our God has always been a compassionate, kind God. We are introduced to him or we read about him in the Old Testament in the midst of him talking about this nation and getting us back in a relationship with our God. And it has caused people to read the scriptures from a perspective that is not true. And I want you to think about that as we go through this this morning. How do you view God? How you view God will determine a lot of things in your life. It'll determine your worldview. It'll determine your spiritual view. People will fall away because of their view of God or what they can't imagine Him to do. And there's a tremendous misunderstanding of what it actually says about Him or what we're told about Him. So I want you to think about this with me this morning as we think about how we view God. Do we view God as a man? And you may think that that's an odd thing to say. 
I assure you there are people that believe or that view Jesus still as a man. He is the Son of God, the glorified Christ today. And he's still viewed as a Jewish man. But why I ask that question is I want you to consider how often we bring him down to our level. What was the motive behind why God did something? Why would he do that? And then the answer a lot of times is based on how I would view something. Our perspective of God or our view of God or how we view motivation is vastly different than God. And I suggest to you, as soon as you bring him down to our level, you're in trouble. You're absolutely in trouble. In Isaiah, the 45th chapter, Isaiah begins this conversation and Studying Isaiah, and now we're studying Jeremiah on the Thursday, in the Thursday class, has been eye-opening to me. And if you have the opportunity to come to class, I, I would love for you to join us. But just studying these books have been uh, eye-opening for how much God loves us and how much he hates sin. Isaiah, the 45th chapter, in verse 9, says, Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. A piece of pottery among the other earthenware pottery pieces. With the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the things you are making say he has no hands. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you fathering? Or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? <coughs> Would a piece of pottery turn around to the one making the pottery and say, what are you doing? And yet that's exactly what humans do to their God. That's the point. We question the things that he does or why things occur. And in many cases, we add points that aren't even given to us. So much so in Deuteronomy, this 29th chapter, verse 29, we're told that there are secret things of God. There are secret things. You know what that word secret means? Some of us may not. Secrets aren't something that you're told that you're going to be able to tell somebody else. There are secret things of God. That means that there's things that you will never no. And trying to come to a conclusion on things we will never know is a dangerous road to go. It's focusing on what God has told us that truly matters. The Bible gives us all things for life and godliness. It does not answer every single question offered. I want you to think about the book of Jonah just for a minute. What does the book of Jonah tell, Jonah tell us? It tells us that God worked in other nations other than Israel. But we're not told how he did it. We're not told what he did. We're not told how often he tried to get Babylon to repent. Or how often he tried to get Egypt or Canaan to repent. What we're told is what the judgment is on them. And so the connection, rather than thinking about this God who loves all, who is kind and compassionate, giving people time and time and time again to get their lives right with him. Just, just destroyed them. That's all he did. It's an absolute mistake of the God we read of the, the Bible. He loves his people, his creation. Israel was unique for sure. But make no mistake about it. Certainly the book of Jonah and so many other places tell us very clearly God works in nations. God's desire is for all men to be saved. Just because you or because I don't know it doesn't mean it's not true. It's important for us to understand the bigger picture of God. There are secret things of him. And then you come to chapter 55 of Isaiah. What's even greater than this is the danger of these verses and forgetting them. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and your, my thoughts than your thoughts. And you know what we do? We bring him down to our level. He just literally said, you can't do that. My thoughts are above your thoughts. My reasons are above your reasons. We need to understand 
that when it comes to God, he's beyond our understanding. We try to describe things. We're going to talk about love here in just a minute. How do you describe God's love? The Bible says he's love. That's how it describes it. God is love. What does that mean? And you can give examples and we can kind of try to explain what that means. But what does it really mean? This is something that is beyond our comprehension of understanding him. When it comes to our God and who he is, he is absolutely working. And it doesn't mean he asked you for permission to tell you or me. So much so in Habakkuk, he tells them that. He says, if I, you wouldn't even believe me if I told you what I'm doing. You think God's saying that because he thinks that Habakkuk would have believed him? Sounds to me like he's saying, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He's God. He is greater than us. Do we view him from the perspective of bringing him down to our level only? And do we view him to be not loving? When we open God's word, I think one of the things we need to understand right off the bat, that God loves you more than you will ever understand. In every single passage that you read, in everything that you're studying in God's word, that should be the foundation of where we begin. He is the all-powerful, almighty God. He is not man, and he loves you more than you will ever understand. And there's passages after passages that talk about this. Romans, the fifth chapter, certainly is a familiar one that we go to where he says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's such a simple verse that is so awesome, so powerful. While you were his enemies, while you were helpless, while you were sinners, this chapter will go on to talk about, he sent his son to die for you because he loves you so much. But I assure you, as the same passage we'll talk about, it's because he hates sin. It keeps from the wrath of our God. Why? Because he hates sin. I said this a few weeks ago, and I just want to make this so unbelievably clear. The biggest issue that I see that we can struggle with so often is for us not to understand how much God loves us and how much he hates sin. We might sit there and think about the love piece of it. I don't think we really understand how much he absolutely hates sin. That's the problem. When we look around and we say, why would bad things happen to good people? The first definition we've got to figure out is what is a good person. What makes a good person? Is a good person the same thing as a saved person? There's different conversations that you need to have. And there's different definitions that people have in the world compared to how God views things. And instead of going up to God's level, as we're going to see, we tend to bring him down to ours. Think about Romans, the eighth chapter, 35 through the end of this chapter, really. But it's talking about in verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37, but we in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We talk a lot about the fact that, yes, there are things that we can do. We can leave him. But there is nothing that will separate you from the love that he has for you. Nothing. The verses that we read, the, some of the verses that we read a few minutes ago in Ephesians, in Ephesians, the third chapter, talks about this as well, leading up to the verses that were read. You get this idea, and I'll pick up in the middle of a, a verse here. In verse 18, he says, may be, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. According to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus. To our generations forever and ever. Amen. 
I want you to think about this for just a minute. In verse 20, when it says he's able to do far beyond all that we think, other versions say imagine. He can do beyond all that you imagine. And then we stop. Christians will stop and look around this world and say that there is nothing that can be done. How is anything ever going to change? All the different questions that people ask and believe. How do you couple that with this verse? My God can do all things beyond I can even comprehend or imagine. Is your God different than mine? I think, honestly, that's the problem. God's people forget how awesome our God is. He's greater than all. People that are caught up in horrible things in this world, you know what God can do? Save them. Save them. You know what the problem sometimes is? I'm too scared or don't think it's going to work to talk to them. You don't think God's working in the country? Why do you think you're here? So we spend so much time complaining about things as humans. Just humans in general. So some of us are really good at it. And then you turn around and you read a verse like this and you're like, that's cute. He can do beyond all that I can ask or think or imagine. And brethren, some of you have amazing imaginations. The problem is they go in the wrong direction. They go in the wrong direction. It's getting worse and worse and worse. My God is bigger than anything that you're going to go through. And we focus on the worst part. Focus on the God part. That's what separates us from everyone else. You know what separated Israel from every other group? It wasn't because they were bigger or more powerful or had bigger weapons or more money. It was God. God separated them. You know what separates the church, his kingdom, from any other kingdom ever? God. That's the citizenship we're striving for. That's the one that is eternal. And we get way too caught up in things that, quite frankly, just do not matter. We talk about majoring in the minors or focusing on what truly matters in this world. I'm going to tell you what matters in this world. Your relationship with God is what matters in this world. Other people's relationship with God is what matters in this world. And we can say this all day long. If you are living it, it's vastly different than just simply saying it. Your attitude isn't swayed every four years. My trust doesn't change because things happen in my life. My faith is built on him no matter what comes. It's easy to say. Facebook posts show something different sometimes. What I think is so powerful of our Savior and our God is that this same God we worship in the Old Testament is exactly the same as the one we see in the Old Testament. And that's what I love about studying Jeremiah and Isaiah. If you turn with me to Jeremiah, the third chapter, I want you to notice what God offers these people. So you have this story or the situation at this time. You have a king in Josiah who was very, very faithful. The problem was the people weren't. They were not all following. Jeremiah, or, uh, Josiah's grandfather and his dad were not good people. They were the ones that were sacrificing, in particular his grandfather, sacrificing their children to idols. And so the people's hearts were an issue. But this is what God offers. It's going to sound familiar. In verse 19, this is his offer. How I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of the nations. And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from following me. That's his offer to you. It was his offer to them. 
I will give you blessings galore. You cannot even imagine what I can give you. And I will give you this inheritance that is just so awesome. And you can call me your father. Man's response. Man's choice. Verse 20. However, as a woman treacherously leaves her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me. House of Israel declares the Lord. The problem was in God. The problem was man. That's always been the issue from the beginning. You think about the Old Testament in the beginning of it, his amazing creation creates man, and then sin comes in. The first two brothers, what happens? You talk about free will. I'm not just angry with Abel, I killed him. And time and time and time again, as the Bible goes on, you see what happens with the power of choice. And this is how God words it. However, as a woman treacherously leaves her lover, so you have dealt treacherously with me. But do you know the amazing thing about this, brethren? That's not the way that, I, that Israel viewed it. And that's not the way that people today view it. I want you to notice the book of Jeremiah. Was God a just God? Why do these things happen? Is he just? I'm not talking about fair. Fair is a human issue. Just. I used to get, my brother and I would get baseball card packs. And he would get like three reds and I would get no reds. That's not fair. Why would God allow that to happen? It's not fair. There's a lot of things in life that we can say aren't fair. Fair. You've got to be careful saying it in America, by the way. But we can talk about fair. God is just. And I'm going to tell you, if God wasn't loving or merciful, this is fearful to talk about his justice. Because you know what you deserve, and I deserve, is vastly different than how he treats us. But this is the issue in Jeremiah's time. This may sound familiar. God asked this question. He talked about how he remembers how they used to be. They were devoted to them. They were following him. And then verse 5. God says, what injustice did your fathers find in me? That they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty. What injustice did I do? It's the question. God's people leave him. There's the question. What injustice did I do? You're going to say I'm not just. What injustice did I do? The response of Israel is going to be, well, look at all the bad things that we're going to be going through. So he says, all right, let's think about that for just a second. Here's the truth of the matter. He talks about all these things that has occurred to them. The priests have left all the things that are going on in verse 7 and following. And then you get to verse 11. And he says, I want you to look at all the other nations. And I want you to think about you. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have exchanged their glory for that which has, is of no benefit. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, to carve out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that do not hold water. What was the truth? Israel left. They began to do their own thing. What's the truth today? We do the exact same thing. The problem was that's not the way that they viewed it. Verse 17. He talks about the fact that they, are you a slave? Were you born this way? As he talks about in verse 14, he's, the point he's getting to is you are free. And you've chosen to go back. Verse 17, he says, Have you not done this to yourself by abandoning the Lord your God when he led you in the way? It's your choice. You've chosen the things that are happening. Verse 19, 
Your own wickedness will correct you. Your own apostasies will punish you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to abandon the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of armies. Skip over to chapter 4 and verse 18. Your ways and your deeds have brought these things upon you. This is your evil. How bitter, how it has touched your heart. What has brought things into this world? Mankind. We have. One of the things that is so difficult, and you can just turn on the news to see this, is that I cannot stand that there are bad people that have free will. That can choose horrible things. You see it every single day. The problem with free will is we all have it. The best part of free will is that we all have it. What comes with that, though, is the consequences. Bad people do bad things. They choose bad things. And you see it time and time and time again. And our news knows that they make money off of showing us the negative stories because we're not big fans of the positive ones, evidently. So we understand what free will is. Why wouldn't God stop them? It's free will. It's amazing when you think about our God and what the truth is of what has happened. But then you take the next step. This is how man views this. This is the problem. So God has just simply made it very clear. You've abandoned me. You've left me. This is how Israel, Judah, viewed it in verse 22. Although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is before me, declares the Lord. How can you say, I'm not defiled? I have not gone after the bales. Look at your way, look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are swift Young camel run about senselessly on her ways. And then he talks about some other animals. But the point in verse 3 is very clear. Two parts. First of all, you can't, you can't cleanse yourself. Couldn't in the Old Testament, you can't now. Only God can. How am I defiled? The second part that's a problem is that they thought what they were doing that was wrong was done in secret. Nobody saw it. Guess who saw it? God. Same as today. The justification was huge. Verse 35, how else did they view themselves? You say, I'm innocent. Surely his anger is turned away from me. Behold, I will enter judgment with you because you say, I have not sinned. Why do you go around so much changing your ways? Also, you will be put to shame by Egypt, just as you were put to shame by Assyria. The justification. I haven't sinned. What did I do? Brethren, one of the hardest parts to me about sin is this. We categorize sin so much. And there certainly are different consequences to different sins. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus Christ died for the smallest, littlest lie that you've ever given. For this, and also for the serial killer that killed a lot of different people. He died for... For sin. Period. I crucified Jesus Christ. You crucified him. There certainly are horrible things. I'm not in any way suggesting that. There's not. But when it comes to our Savior's death, we are not innocent. We have got to be careful how often we justify sin. We've got to be careful of making what we do smaller than what it really is. This is the same response that was needed by them as what's needed today. He tells them in this passage, I need you to repent. I want you to repent. But it can't be a repentance of because I got caught repentant. I'm sorry I got caught repentant. That's sometimes or a lot of times how we repent. Here in Jeremiah, the fourth chapter, and also in 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, verse 9 and 10, it's the same thing. It's true repentance. 
Here in Jeremiah's case, it's the if-then statements that you give. If you're willing to return to me, let me tell you what that means. You're going to get rid of everything, all idolatry, everything that is detestable. If you swear, in verse 2, as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will boast. But it's up to you. Verse 4 goes on and says, I want your heart. It's always been about the heart. If you read the Old Testament, and you do not come away understanding that it is about our relationship with God from the beginning, and it's always been about our heart, I encourage you to read it again. Read it again. It's always about our hearts. And it always has been about our hearts. The amazing thing to me when it comes to scriptures, and I try to make application to myself, is it doesn't matter how you view sin. One of the amazing things in Jeremiah, then certainly the people that have been in the class hopefully have, have caught on to, is that God views the sins of Israel and Judah as adultery. Adultery. You've cheated on me. No, we didn't. How did we do that? I'm innocent. It doesn't matter how Israel viewed it. God says, you are an adulterer to me. Brethren. Our job is not to change God's mind on what sin is. It's to change ours. He hates it. And therefore, God's people hate it. Not the person. Not the people. The sin. And we need to understand how our God views it. And therefore, how we need to view sin. So the question, as we bring the lesson to a close... Is it your father? You know, the amazing thing about God again is he gave Israel and he gives us the same choice. I, he doesn't have to be your father. That's your choice. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to offer you, as he says. He does this in the New Testament as well. I'm going to give you the opportunity to be my children. First John, the third chapter in verse one will say that you have the opportunity to be my children. It's an amazing thing to say. The verse that we read earlier is the offer of God. The problem is that word, however. That's our side. What's your choice? John, the fourth chapter in verse four says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is what? Loud. Hostility towards God. It doesn't matter whether or not you like it or how you view it. Friendship with the world is hostility towards God. You adulteresses. Don't ever miss how God views it. We need to make sure that we are viewing God for who he is. I know that there are people that struggle with this view of God. And I assure you, it's not simply because they've read it. It's because they put their bias into the Bible. Our God is not man. He does not think as a man. He tells us that my, his thoughts are above our thoughts. That he does not lie as a man. Our God loves us more than you can ever imagine. That he was willing to try to save and did save, or relent at least for a while, against Assyria. That he sent his son to die for those in Rome and those that live today. Whether they believe in him or not. But he is a just God. There is coming a day where we're going to see that justice. But by his grace and mercy, we have the opportunity to have our sins washed away. To be his children. But if we are caught up in sin. One thing I can tell you for sure. Is that if we are stained with sin. Not willing to remove that sin by our God. Doing the things that he wants us to do. You will not be with him for eternity. I will not be with him for eternity. It's what separates us. 
By his grace and mercy, we have the opportunity now to get our lives right with him. If you have questions, ask. Ask your questions. This is about your soul. If you need to change your perspective of our God, I encourage you to do so. Hopefully this sparks some conversation today with your children, with your spouse, understanding how much higher he is than us and what he truly deserves from us. If you are ready and willing to become his child right now, you have that opportunity. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of the sins that you've committed, to confess Him as the Lord that He is, and be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins, now's the time. Don't justify things. Don't try to change what it says. That's what it says. And if we can help you with that, we would love the opportunity. If there's anything that we can do for you, I ask you to please come as we stand and sing.